welcome the Misconceptions, a program that is committed to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Romo Gusein, and today we have with us Dr. Mark Harwood from Creation Ministries International. Now, Dr. Mark will be speaking to us, as he has been, about science and the Bible. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mark. Thank you very much, Rommel. It's a privilege to be here. It's always a pleasure to have you come here and share some of your insights with us. Now, what I would like to speak about specifically today is genetics. Uh, let me start off by asking you now, is there any evidence for genetics found in the Bible? Well, actually, there is, um, in a sense. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, the Bible is not a, a genetics handbook, per se, but the opening chapters of the book of Genesis describe or give an historic record of what God actually did when he created the heavens and the earth. And of course, the first 11 chapters cover the uh, ensuing events right up to the time of Abraham. So those passages are actual history. And they tell us about the fall, about the Tower of Babel, sorry, the, the, the um, flood of Noah and then the Tower of Babel. And these events are actually reflected in the physical world around us. So when we see in the very first verse of the Bible where it says God created the heavens and the earth, then what it says is that there was a creator that made all living things. So when we look at genetics, we find reflected in genetic information and the science of genetics, the actual events of our origins. Um, for instance, uh, we know that the genetic instructions that we find in our DNA represent information. And that information, in fact, only comes from a mind. Mm -hmm. Random accidental processes cannot lead to information. Mm. In fact, Professor Paul Davies says this, there is no known law of physics able to create information from nothing. So the genetic code, the fact that it exists, is exactly consistent with the statement that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm. But there's actually more to it than that because the Bible tells us that as a result of the rebellion uh, of Adam and Eve, the fall, as it's called, that the whole of creation is in bondage to decay. We read that in the book of Romans, chapter 8. Now, when we look around us, we discover that all of life is actually fading away. It's running down. Mm. It's a process called genetic entropy. And what I mean by that is that entropy is a measure of disorder, if you will. So genetic entropy is a process by which the coded instructions on our genes are actually getting more and more disordered. Mm. Now, that comes about from mutations. And we talked about mutations last time, but mutations are copying mistakes from generation to generation. That's right. So every single one of us is affected by genetic entropy. And in fact, Dr. John Sanford, who is a world famous geneticist, he invented a device called the gene gun, which is used extensively in, in, uh, in agriculture. He, he said these things, there are at least a hundred new mutations per person per generation. There are tens of thousands of bad mutations that each and every one of us carry. Wow. Two to three percent of all babies born have visible birth defects today. Mm. And in Australia, five percent of babies born have a genetic disease. This is a very serious problem. There are over 6,000 human Mendelian diseases that have been identified. And by Mendelian, I mean an inheritable genetic disease. Mm. So human geneticists do agree that we are actually degenerating. Now, that's exactly what the Bible says, isn't it? Mm. That all of creation is in bondage to decay. And that is a consequence of Adam and Eve's rebellion against their creator, God. So in that very real sense, we find genetic evidence in the world around us, which is exactly consistent with what the Bible says. In fact, it's interesting, you know, genetic entropy tells us that natural selection cannot even preserve the genome, that is the DNA code, let alone improve it. Wow. And how often do we hear it said that evolution is real, it's a, it's a process going from simple to complex, getting better and better all the time. But the observable reality is not that. The mm. observable reality is 
it's a downhill process. We're getting worse and worse. Mm, now that's a real sad story. It's not something to, you know, be encouraged by or when you when you listen to that, I mean, it doesn't seem like we're going from strength to strength or we're sort of growing or becoming a more advanced, you know, I shouldn't say advanced society, but in ourselves, our bodies, our, our physical aspect that's, is that's becoming wrong. better that's or wrong. stronger. In we're that. actually becoming less fit to live progressively. And you're right, it's a bad news story. Mm. But that's why the gospel is such a good news story. Mm. Because for every single one of us, our physical lives will come to an end. But there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth, the Bible tells us, that will not be subject to decay like this present earth is. You know, it's no wonder Jesus said to his disciples, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Mm. Because all of these things will just be wiped out in due course. Exactly. That's right. So now, does natural selection improve the DNA code? No. In fact, genetic entropy shows us that it can't even preserve it, let alone improve it. Mm. And, and if you think about it, that flies directly in the face of Darwinian evolution, which tells us a story of things getting better and better and better, going from simple to complex, and now we're evolving uh, socially or, or whatever. But the scientifically observable reality is not that. Okay. So also, is there any evidence in genetics which leads us back to an original man and woman? I, I, there absolutely is. In fact, if you think about it, if with each passing generation, the genetic code is deteriorating because of accumulated mutations, then if I go back in time, then the genetic code is getting better and better. And if I keep going back and back and back, there must come a point right at the beginning where the genetic code was perfect. Mm. And that, of course, is the perfect original man and woman the Bible describes as Adam and Eve. Mm. But there are other ways, you know, in which the science of genetics confirms the Bible. For instance, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, we read, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. You know, it's interesting that in our cells, there are these organelles called mitochondria. They're actually like the powerhouse of the cell. But in the mitochondria, there is DNA, which is different from the DNA that we find in the nucleus of our cells. Okay. And the difference is that the mitochondrial DNA is passed on to us from our mothers. Only from the mothers? Only from the mother. So okay. you can trace your maternal lineage back if you had all of the, the DNA evidence available. And uh, scientists have discovered that um, all human beings have a common, if you like, a base blueprint of mitochondrial DNA, which means that we all had one original mother, one woman. They call her mitochondrial Eve. Mm -hmm. Now, that of course is exactly <laughs> consistent with what the Bible says. Now, mind you, the evolutionists are not saying that there was one original woman. They're simply saying that all of the other women and their lineages died out, but okay. just this one survived. survived yeah. But my point is that it is exactly consistent with what the Bible says. Mm. So genetics is, uh, is, is verifying, if you like, not proving. We don't prove the Bible with science, but it's consistent with the Bible's story. Mm. Let me share another interesting one with you. Um, there was a newspaper headline that said that um, uh, when God created woman, man was not even a glint in the eye, which sounds a bit funny. But what they've discovered is that looking at the difference between mutations in mitochondrial DNA, which comes from our mother, and in the case of men, looking at their Y chromosomes, of course, only men have X and Y chromosomes. That's what defines the male. Women have only have two X chromosomes. So looking at mutations in Y chromosomes, scientists have concluded that the Y chromosome um, is more recent than the mitochondrial DNA. So they concluded, therefore, that Eve must have lived many thousands of years before Adam. Well, that's a real problem. Well, you'd have because to think the Bible it would says be, wouldn't that, it? Yeah, I mean, the Bible says that Adam was created first and then God created, wasn't too long after, but he created Eve. Day, yeah. The same day. Oh, same day, yes. Absolutely, on yes. day six it's of creation right. week. <laughs> <laughs> but, you see, what the geneticists are finding is actually consistent with the Bible story. And let me show you on this chart. Uh -huh. You see, 
from the present day back to the time of Eve, according to the Bible timelines, is about 6,000 years. So you would imagine, therefore, there's been 6,000 years of accumulated mitochondrial DNA mutations. Mm -hmm. But males would all have come from Noah and then, of course, his three sons. And the Bible says that all the nations of the world um, have, been, uh, have descended from Noah's three sons and their three wives. And so it's only four and a half thousand years back to Noah. So he is four and a half thousand years ago, the, the earliest uh, common point, if you like, of Y chromosomes. Mm. So there's only been four and a half thousand years of mutational accumulation. So the geneticists are actually right to conclude that modern Y chromosomes are younger than modern mitochondrial DNA. So it can be explained. But, you see, that's exactly <laughs> consistent with the Bible's record uh -huh. of history. Now, they believe, of course, that Eve lived further uh, ago, or longer ago than just 6,000 years, but that's based on assumptions about the rates of mitochondrial DNA mutations. Okay. And uh, they believe that these mutations would accumulate at the rate of uh, approximately uh, one per 600 generations. But recent observations have shown that the rates are more likely one every 30 to 40 generations or even less. Mm. So when you correct the molecular clock based on current observations, you find that mitochondrial Eve must have lived about 6,000 years ago. Mm. So it's but a lot closer, yeah. But that's consistent with the Bible's record and the mm. genealogies that we find here that tell us that the creation took place about 6,000 years ago. Wow. So if we can move forward now, where did mm. the first living cell actually come from? Ah, you've asked a profound question here, Ronald. This is... <laughs> That's perhaps, what I do. <laughs> <laughs> you do it very well. Perhaps this is the, uh, the most um, critical issue, I guess, that any naturalistic explanation for yes. origins has to address. Mm. Because someone who believes that the universe came about and life came about through random naturalistic processes has to address this question. You see, Darwinian evolution deals with changes in living organisms, but you have to have a self-reproducing living cell before natural selection can even act on it, right? Mm. So where did that first cell come from? And, and this, this is a profound question. It's a process that's called abiogenesis, if you like. Um, and, and let me explain. It's another way of saying it is like spontaneous generation. Because at some stage in this naturalistic account of origins, uh, just ordinary inanimate chemicals had to assemble themselves into the first self-reproducing living cell. Mm. And uh, there used to be a time when people thought that living things would spontaneously arise. Like in the 1600s, they thought that maggots would arise spontaneously out of rotting meat. <laughs> and uh, there was a famous uh, experiment conducted by a guy called Francesco Reddy. And uh, he showed that it was only pieces of meat that flies could land on that actually uh -huh. produced maggots as mm. the meat rotted. Um, in a, a piece of meat in a sealed container, uh, it didn't have any maggots coming from it. So he proved that spontaneous generation did not Doesn't occur. occur yes. And then in the middle 1800s, uh, Louis Pasteur also showed that microbes did not arise spontaneously either. And he, in fact, stated the law of biogenesis, which says simply that life only originates from life. Now, that's observable science. Any living thing that we see today had parents. It mm. came from another living thing of mm. the same kind. But, I mean, surely, I mean, if you give something enough time, it will come about. Well, people... It'll be formed, it'll be created. People like to argue that, but it, in fact, it doesn't really work. Can I come to that in a moment, though? But, okay. But the key thing here is that the, the evolutionary paradigm or this idea of naturalistic processes forces people to believe in spontaneous generation or abiogenesis. Now, to pick up your, your question, um, this whole idea of the, the, um, the first living cell spontaneously arising even if you've had all the time that you like, um, is, is really a, a, a massive leap. Prove it. Well, here's a I'm going to put you on the back foot. You need to prove here, it. Here's a quote <laughs> from Professor Paul Davies. Okay. He, he says this, Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organise themselves into the first living cell. 
Now, can you imagine my laptop computer here um, accidentally forming itself? You know, it's got some complicated parts. It's got a keyboard, a motherboard, a screen, a battery, hard drive, and so on. I mean, it's no, preposterous, it's isn't it? Yeah. But let's assume that it actually did, and that all these hardware pieces just accidentally came together. Okay. It's still useless because it won't work without an operating system. You see, it's got to have software. Mm. So Paul Davies goes on and says, how did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? <laughs> see, that's a very profound question. Mm. If you could enlarge a living cell, you would discover a massively complex organism. In fact, Michael Denton, in his book, A Theory in Crisis, Evolution rather, A Theory in Crisis, said this, to grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometres in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an, an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. We would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. Wow. So what we find is transport systems that we talked about last session. We find mm. factories com producing component parts. We talked about the mitochondria a little while ago. That's like the powerhouse of the cell. Inside the mitochondria, as we can see here in this diagram, there are these membranes called cristae. And embedded on these membranes are these incredible little electric motors, mm. part of what's called the ATP synthase enzyme. And these are absolutely staggering. These motors rotate um, at about um, 10,000 RPM and they produce what's called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's the energy currency of the cell. So if you so much as blink an eye or move a muscle, then your cells are consuming ATP. Mm. Now, with the aid of electron microscopes, scientists have actually been able to look at this little motor and how it works inside the cell. Now, bear in mind, any one cell has hundreds of thousands of these little ATP synthase enzymes busily producing ATP, the energy currency of the cell. Now we've produced this animation based on electron microscope images of what the actual proteins and the shapes look like, greatly slowed down. And of course the colours are just there for artistic licence. But you can see the little motor rotating down there. It works on protons or positive electricity. The motor drives up through a central shaft to these assemblies above where adenosine diphosphate or ADP is combined with a phosphate ion in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP. Now, we see this happening in three sectors. Here's a top view of it. And these three sectors operate in turn, producing three molecules of ATP with every rotation of that central shaft. Now, that motor exhibits all of the features of a magnificently designed nanotechnology motor. And uh, it's an extraordinary device. Now, I could just imagine how the first cell came about. Mm. There had to be thousands of these little motors which just all came together for no particular reason <laughs> and they're just lying about. And then we needed some other biological component parts to come along and then all of a sudden they all assemble themselves into the first living cell. You see, without an ATP synthase enzyme and thousands of them, the first it's cell not happen, yeah. could not have existed. Mm. Um, it is indeed a profound problem. But you asked me an important question before. Yes. If I had enough time, surely anything is possible. That's right. That's what we're told. Well, and that's the answer that the naturalistic um, evolutionists put forward. They say, mm. yeah, you're right. It's incredibly lucky. What an amazing world we live in. We won a lottery. Mm. You know, given enough time, anything can happen. Well, let's examine that proposition. Okay. So how much time would you like? let's say the entire history of the Big Bang universe, 14 billion years, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there are about 10 to the 80th atoms in the entire universe. That's the number one with 80 zeros after it. That's a prodigious number, <laughs> the number of atoms in the entire universe, right? Big number. Now, let's imagine that every single atom is um, like an experiment. It's an interaction happening, uh, let's say, a thousand times a second for argument's sake. Mm -hmm. So this is happening, let's say then the, the total number of experiments we could have in the universe is 
a thousand a second times all the atoms in the universe, 10 to the 80th times the entire 4 billion, 14 billion years of the, of the, uh, the Big Bang universe. Mm -hmm. Now, if we multiply all those numbers together, we find out that the maximum number of experiments is uh, over 10 to the hundredth. Now, that's the number 10 with 100 zeros after it. Wow. Right? That's a staggeringly big number. Mm. Okay, so what's the chance now of forming a single protein, an average size protein of 300 amino acids, just an ordinary one, not okay. too big? And uh, it turns out that there are 20 amino acids uh, that are, are used in, in living protein, in living systems. So the number of possibilities is 20 to the power 300, or that is the same as 10 to the power 390, or 10 with 390 zeros after it. Now remember we had 10 to the 100 um, possible experiments yes. that could be formed. So that means that the chance of forming just one protein is one chance in 10 to the 290. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean anything much, does it? That's right. You know, it's a lot of zeros. Are, well, they're just too big. Yeah. But let me give you an illustration. I have a, a, a MasterCard, and uh, I could give you my MasterCard. I might, I might not, yeah. but <laughs> let, let's say I gave Depends it Depends how you. much money you got. Yes, yeah. <laughs> now, my MasterCard is protected by a four-digit pin. That's right, right? yeah. So you could go to an ATM, ATM yeah. Yeah, put the card in, and let's say I gave you one chance at guessing my four-digit pin. You know, the probability of you getting it right in one go is one in 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, which is one in 10,000. Wow. Now, that's a pretty small chance. So mm. I'm reasonably comfortable that you're not going to get yeah. it, right? This number that we're talking about is the equivalent of guessing a 290 digit pin in one go oh. and not getting it wrong. In other words, no mistakes. That's impossible. Well, of course it's impossible. Yeah, no one in their right mind would. Now that, remember, is the probability of forming just one average protein. Wow. But you need thousands, mm. millions of proteins to form an operating, self-replicating living cell. Mm. So in all of available time, it could not possibly have happened. It's mind-boggling stuff, honestly. Well, it's, it's even worse than that <laughs> because that living cell has to self-replicate. Mm. It has to be able to produce itself. No man-made machine can do that. That's right. And the protein synthesis process by which cells build themselves and copy themselves is in itself a staggeringly complex process. Wow. And perhaps if I could just share with you what happens in protein yeah, yeah, synthesis please. quickly to, uh -huh. to close this session. Protein synthesis requires the coded instructions on the DNA to be read, a process called transcription, requiring a machine called the RNA polymerase. That then produces a messenger RNA strand, which is read by a ribosome and transfer RNA molecules to produce a string of amino acids, which when connected together, forms a protein, a long amino acid chain. Now, all of that doesn't mean a great deal. So what we've done is produce an animation of what is going on inside the cell when it produces a protein. And let's have a look at it. We see here the first of the base pairs, a nucleotide that's called a letter in the DNA. When it's combined with a sugar molecule, it's called a nucleoside. Here we see the DNA molecule, that long strand, the double helix with the links between it, which are the letters of the DNA. Zooming past there in the background goes the RNA polymerase machine. Now what it does is to take the nuclear sides, the letters in one end, and it unzips the DNA inside, matches the nuclear sides to the code that's on the DNA molecule to produce a complementary code. It then zips up the DNA again, and that long strand now of messenger RNA is uh, emitted from the RNA polymerase machine. It then encounters a stop code and now we have this long strand of messenger RNA with a complementary code on, from the DNA that was, uh, that was read. Here we see the transfer RNA molecules. And uh, these, along with the messenger RNA, are fed into a machine called a ribosome. Now the ribosome takes the transfer RNA molecules and matches them to the coded instructions three letters at a time on the messenger RNA. Those three letters are called a codon. And at the other end of the transfer RNA molecule is an amino acid, that red molecule, 
and they're bolted on together in exactly the correct sequence as determined by the coded instructions on the DNA. So as this long chain of amino acids emerges from the ribosome, these organelles called chaperones come along, they latch onto that long strand to firstly present it, prevent it rather from prematurely folding, but also to transport it to this next machine, a barrel shaped object called the chaperone in. Now the messenger, sorry, the amino acid chain is then fed into the chaperonin and no one really knows what happens inside this, but it all happens in a fraction of a second and it folds this long chain of amino acids into various loops and bends and straight sections because the shape of the emerging protein determines its function and how it fits into the part of the organism that it's destined for. So finally emerging now is the replicated protein. This is just for one protein. And this process is happening inside the cells of your body all the time. And that's just one part of the mechanism by which a cell reproduces itself. Wow, that's amazing. Isn't I that mean, staggering? It is. I mean, the way you tell the story there is really incredible. I mean, to, to be able to see that there is really a mind behind this, it's impossible for these things to come about by time or chance or coincidence. Absolutely. You, you can really clearly see that. And anyone that really studies that will come to terms or will actually start to ask these types of questions. That's what right. does this all mean in biblical context? Well, fundamentally, it means this, that biology and in particular genetics unmistakably reveals the fingerprint of our Creator God, mm. the God who revealed himself to us in this book, the Bible. Mm. And if we go to the Word of God, we can learn about not only who our Creator is and what he's like, but also his plan of redemption for us. We can be in relationship with our Creator God through faith in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Mark, thank you once again for being able to come here and share some of your insights with us. Thank if I can you just all. Thank you. If I can just simply wrap things up by saying to our audience, I really pray and hope that you found this episode to be informative. Please stay in tune for the very next episode. And until then, may God bless you. Goodbye.